when we started devising which topics we were going to cover and how we were going to cover them, we, we thought, okay, we're going to keep as much as possible the politics out of it, and we don't really want to get into discussions of the political horse race and who's up and down in the polls and so on. But uh, with climate policy, <laughs> it's very difficult to talk about climate policy which, uh, without talking at least a little bit about the politics. This is one, uh, one of the policy areas that's so incredibly politicized right now in Canada. So you've, you've been duly warned that we will talk a little bit about politics at, in, in amongst our very substantive discussion on, on the public policy. Uh, before we begin, though, I'll ask Chris Reagan from McGill's Max Bell School of Public Policy to say a few words. We're very appreciative of Max Bell, uh, their uh, partnership in this series of four events. Was one of the big things that I learned was that policy is way more complex than most academics think it is. Uh, You know, there are many reasons why a good idea on paper doesn't actually get implemented. Whether it's difficulties in communication or figuring out who the stakeholders are and managing those relationships or dealing with the interaction between uh, nonpartisan policy makers and partisan elected officials or uh, dealing with transparency and accountability or the budgeting process. There's lots of things that make policy complex. And a second thing that I learned, which is related to the first really, is that there is a large gap, a disconnect, I would say, between the way academics think about policy and the way policy makers think about policy. Uh, And that actually never became clearer to me when I was at finance than when I was working on the climate change and the climate policy file. Uh, Academics tend to come from first principles and don't have access to a lot of data and information. Policymakers are often in the weeds with data and spending a lot of time dealing with that sort of information. Um, And when I became the director of McGill's new Max Bell School of Public Policy about 18 months ago, I was committed to getting those two lessons uh, into the activities of Max Bell. Uh, And the first thing, just a little bit of propaganda that you may have seen on the way in, um, is a new MPP program that we have developed. And that notion of policy complexity and the various policy complexities is something that is baked right into this program. So if you have somebody in your life who is looking for a, a degree on public policy, send them our way. Uh, but the second thing, David, if you're looking for already, if you're looking for re-education, no, we can we can handle that. <laughs> not what I meant, but okay. <laughs> but the a second thing that we are going to do a lot of um, is is events like this, and we are delighted to be partnering with Policy Options uh, to to put on these events, and, and I'm particularly delighted that that uh, Jennifer and her team actually did most of the work. Uh, that's a really nice kind of event to partner with, but but. We think it's really important that we have lots of public engagement on those complex issues of public policy. And we think, we think that the quality of the public debate these days, not just on this issue, but on this issue and other issues, is not where it should be. And so I think if you, if you look, if you kind of watch the Max Bell space, I think you will see us uh, promoting lots of events of this kind uh, in the near future. Uh, if you happen to be in Toronto on March 5th, by the way, we have a great event on that, on what to expect in the upcoming election. And we've got an event on, in Montreal on April 10th, if you can want to go down the, down the highway a couple of hours to Montreal. The weather will be roughly the same, so don't worry. Um, but the event is about why it makes sense or whether it makes sense to build new pipelines and to price carbon at the same time. That's April 10th. So um, I talked about policy complexity. As Jennifer suggested, this one is about as complex as they get, whether you're talking about the communication of carbon pricing or how it works or who will be impacted, who those stakeholders are that you have to manage. So I'm just going to turn it back over to Jennifer, and her, and she's going to introduce her panel. So Nancy Olweiler is director of the School of Public Policy at Simon Fraser University, which incidentally, SFU won the national case uh, competition over the weekend. So congratulations. Um, And she's also a member of the Ecofiscal Commission. David McLaughlin is the Director of Climate Change for the International Institute for Sustainable Development in Canada. And Céline Bach is the founder and president of Analytica Advisors, an Ottawa-based research and advisory business 
that promotes clean technology and innovation. So let's give them a nice welcome. <laughs> So uh, over the weekend, I heard on the radio someone mention a condition called climate change melancholia, which I, I figure that I've, I've started to suffer from after watching climate policy in Ottawa for 22 years. Um, I wonder if each of you, and I'll go this way from Nancy onward, um, how would you characterize where climate policy is right now in Canada? Where, where have we arrived at? Chaos. Okay. <laughs> uh, it, chaos and confusion. And, uh, you know, it's, it's too bad. It's a complex topic. It's one of the existential threats that we face. We, and I mean we, the whole planet. So it's really too bad that the truth, the information, the data, the, the material that explains what, where we are and what can be done hasn't been communicated and discussed in a good way. Um, I think it's important to have these discussions. I don't think we should hide from it. I think we should put all of those who want to deny. I, I don't really want to talk about climate skeptics because if you're not going to change your mind, I have nothing to say to you. But I do want to talk about the people who have changed from being skeptics into saying it's just too expensive. We can't afford to take action on climate change. And I say, show me how that is. So I want to go out and have people prove what is too expensive. I'm from British Columbia. We've had climate policy, rigorous climate policy, for over 10 years now. Yeah, British Columbia is kind of a weird place, but it's, <laughs> it's doing fine. You know, we, it is not a job-killing carbon tax in British Columbia. Are we so different from the rest of the world and the rest of this country? So let's bring it on. Let's have those discussions. And I think we should, those of us that feel strongly that we can, should, and it's the right thing to do and it's not going to destroy the economy, should put those who argue that it will on notice that prove it. Bring the facts on. Let's see your facts. So when you say there's a job-killing carbon tax, show me a job that's disappeared because of the carbon tax. I'll show you 10 that's been created. But David... Uh do the facts matter? <laughs> <laughs> so he gets the hard questions. <laughs> Keep moving it down the line. <laughs> I'm going to answer your first question yeah. about uh, the melancholia. Politician. And um, uh, I don't know about climate melancholia, but winter melancholia today, I can, I can tell you. But I think we've, you asked where we've arrived, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. We've arrived at an inflection point in this country in my judgment. I think we're going to have a climate election this fall. Uh, ethics and, you know, the normal leadership stuff notwithstanding, which is fair fodder for voters. But I think we are going to have a climate election. Uh, and not just a carbon pricing or carbon tax election. Because uh, things have changed uh, since the last time we had that with a tax on everything and Stefan Dion and Green Shift and that. Chris Reagan is a perfect example of that. We have an Equal Fiscal Commission. We have more facts. You do talk about how facts matter. We didn't have Chris and Equal Fiscal Commission and others out there. We didn't have that policy infrastructure, the think tanks participating and engaging and providing information and context for journalists, for Canadians, for interest groups or whatever to help frame the conversation. <clears throat> so those who want to say no uh, to this are going to have a tougher slog. But fundamentally, the country is going to have a choice because I think uh, the parties will put up, uh, there will be some you know, different policies and some overlap and some distinctions. But I think the real question that will be put to people is do you want to act on climate change or not? And I think there will be some fairly stark choices there, for better or for worse. So um, I've been through a few elections, but I've been participated in a few elections. This smells a bit like 1988 free trade. Uh, not fully, but it's the only uh, sort of analog I can, uh, we, we can point to. And if that's the case, I'm with, you know, Nancy, bring it on. Let's, in that sense, let's, <clears throat> let's have that de uh, debate because we are in a state of, uh, I mean, the policy stasis, the chaos and confusion is really, you know, policy choices, this, that, and the other thing, is really wrapped around whether or not we want to act as a country. There's not a sufficient societal or political consensus Yet, that's there for reasons we all know and we'll talk about, I'm sure. 
But I think we've arrived at a, at a certain point. And fundamentally, I'm a small D Democrat, and I'm okay with that. Hmm. But buckle up. So then where do you think that we are right now, in general, on climate policy? Well, I think there's still, um, there's still a lot of work to do as far as the facts go in this country um, when I compare it to what's going on internationally. Um, you know, there was some work done, uh, early work done on, on climate scenarios uh, before the Paris Agreement <clears throat> and, um, and, and done by one, one particular team, Paul Ekins and, and Christoph McGlade at, at University College London um, on the sort of the, the global resource wealth uh, regarding hydrocarbons. And they concluded that um, a third of gas a half half of oil and 80% of coal reserves need to stay in the ground, and I, you know, that those are the kinds of facts that are now being translated into uh, some pretty important, uh, what I, I would call some ambition loops between the private sector and policy uh, uh, people. So, so you know, private sector stepping up and um, making certain commitments. Um, I would uh, point to, for example, we mean business as a global uh, movement of. Uh, you know, Fortune 500 corporations that are stepping up and making commitments. Um, I would point to the investor agenda, uh, you know, which uh, which brings together about 500 of the world's largest pension funds that together have 30 trillion dollars in assets uh, that are also, uh, you know, making commitments and, and moving forward. Um, and those, you know, those kinds of uh, entities that are private sector led. Are leading to space, you know, for there to be uh, public public sector commitments and commitments from politicians. Um, that space is being taken up um, to make commitments, for example, to 100% decarbonization by 2050. Uh, you know, that's not something that we talk about in this country very much. And uh, the space is also being taken up to make commitments to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which again is not something that we talk about very much in this country. Um, and th- you know, those, uh, those fact bases that have to do with access to energy for all, that have to do with um, you know, how the, the carbon budget gets uh, split up, uh, with the role that central banks play in that kind of discussion, um, all of those things are, are you know, being driven uh, by investments in public policy um, you know, with with I think some some different degrees of uh, I guess uh, commitment, but you know Europe, China, uh, sub state level in the U.S. There's an awful lot happening. I want to uh, ask you, Nancy. David said he thinks this is going to be a, a, a climate election. Do you agree? Yeah. And why? Well, as, as I said, I hope so. I mean, I hope it doesn't get buried, and I hope we shouldn't run <clears> from it. Because a number of the parties have made it a part of their platform. Uh, it, it caters to certain people who want to live in the past and not in the future. So I think we've got to start talking about the future in a substantive way. I mean, you know, we've got to start painting the beach, and we want the beach to still be there, not underwater or not destroyed by all the stuff going on around us. So, yeah, I think, I think it will be part of the election issue. My hope is that we can have... A, a genuine Canadian civil discussion about it that we don't ju- jump into, lurch into all of the uh, the name calling and stuff, and we can get out here and have a real discussion about it. So bring it on. And David, you you were, you made reference to where we were ten years ago and so on. I remember um, there was a, a, a time where you not not even the NDP really wanted to go that strong on the environment or on carbon pricing. Um, wh- why has there been this change, do you think? Well, I remember a time when Stephen Harper wanted to go far on uh, climate <laughs> the, and uh, the carbon green pricing. Shift, yeah. uh, you know, he had turning the corner plan, yeah. mm-hmm. which was a, uh, yeah. a national the, cap and corner, trade yeah. uh, plan, which yeah. is carbon pricing, right? You got it. So, um, uh, you know, tout ça change, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think we talk about climate as being a, a, a global disruptor economic and uh, social and uh, all the rest of it. It's a big political disruptor, too. 
It is disrupting uh, how political parties, uh, uh, their coalitions for political parties, so working class people who, uh, who might be afraid of losing jobs, who might have been more traditionally, let's say, New Democrat in, 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 in Canada, or, or that may be thinking, wait a second here, I want to be with the party that, uh, that says I'm going to preserve your job which could be an anti-climate, anti-carbon pricing kind of, uh, kind of piece. So um, we're, we're seeing uh, shifts uh, again in, uh, in the political economy of, uh, of climate and carbon in the, in, in the country and the rise of Western alienation again um, uh, in, in, in response. To this is disruption. And uh, to some degree, it is, it's also a function of what Celine is talking about, is valuation of assets and, and, and how uh, shareholders and others are thinking about the, uh, the future there uh, for their assets and for, uh, and for their wealth and, and hedging their, their bets a little bit. Uh, we are seeing this sort of work down through, you know, uh, through the economy and causing people to say, wait, wait a second, I'm not certain we should have a pipeline or, or, or we should invest here now. For all of you here who are actual shareholders in a pipeline, because we are, <laughs> right? We may think this is kind of you know bad news, but uh, or good news, I guess, depending on it. But what has actually, uh, what is different, I think, this time is both that we are, it is we are more informed, and we are also more confused. And so, picking up a bit on what Nancy said, we are mm. we are more informed because we have uh, policy uh, uh, a more. I guess robust policy conversation underneath. We are more confused because of the factors and, and things that are now mixing up with this. So, climate election, yeah, but we're also in the content. We're going to talk about pipelines. We're going to talk about the you know the security of communities. We're going to talk about federalism and intergovernmental affairs and, 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 and alienation. We're going to talk about the constitution and role of uh, of governments. This is massive sort of political you know disruption. And uh, it's it's fascinating in that, but I you know I don't if I've been a campaign manager I don't quite know what the bumper sticker message I would come up with exactly on that to kind of navigate through. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see. Can can I add one thing, Jennifer? Mm-hmm. And that is we have experience. In two thousand and eight, there was no jurisdiction that had a robust carbon policy. I don't want to keep saying British Columbia, British Columbia, British Columbia, but I am going to say British Columbia. We have 11 years of experience. So we have, it's a different yeah. world. There were the hypotheticals. Now we have actuals. And as Celine said, we have actuals not only here, but in countries like China that are pricing <clears throat> carbon like crazy. So it is different, and we should talk about it. So uh, let me, you, you raised carbon pricing there. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the tools to getting to our, our Paris commitments, which I'll remind you is to reduce annual emissions to 30% below uh, 2005 levels by 2030. Uh, so you're a member of the Ecofiscal Commission, which has been very vocal in its support of carbon pricing as, as the best option for getting to those emission targets. Can you explain sure. why? Sure, be delighted to. Or pretend and cr- you're on the election campaign. Yeah, well, <laughs> and Chris will start jumping up and down if I mess up. So uh, it, it works. I'll say simple terms, and then I can defend them. It works. It does create an incentive to change behavior. We see it happening. It is like the market. We're all used to markets. We love markets. Prices go up, people make adjustments. Prices go down, they make adjustments. Carbon pricing is making and helping the market work. It's cheap. It achieves the target at a lower cost than most of the other policy options we have. And this is, this is a point I want to see you know, really emphasized in whatever happens in the upcoming election. And that is that show me how your policy alternatives are going to achieve the target at a lower cost. I mean, we have evidence out, you know, pages and pages of evidence showing that it's carbon pricing that achieves those targets, the lowest cost to society. It's a policy instrument that we can adapt to protect vulnerable groups, be they households or businesses, and those activities are going on now. In all of the design, for example, in my province, we have low-income supports, which have just been raised in commensurate with the increase in the carbon price. We're working on policies and have them ready to roll on protecting emission-intensive industries that are very trade-exposed, so they cannot raise their prices in response to it. 
and it does provide revenues, which gives governments opportunities to use those revenues, be it for reducing taxes, like in our case, we have the lowest personal income tax rate in the country right now in British Columbia, so that creates jobs, it creates well-being, it creates all sorts of things. And you know, you sort of want it to be across the country. The reason a pan-Canadian price is so important is that makes it easier for business, having one price, sets of regulations. Imagine a carbon policy regime where we have 45 regulations that are different in each province, and you're doing business across Canada. That is hugely costly to businesses. So having a uniformity allows that same sort of uh, decision-making to incur at each point. That revenue can be used, as I said, to cut taxes. A particular province that's right now just finished a court case, um, it's kind of west of here, um, they, they raised their personal uh, provincial sales tax in 2017 by one percentage point. You want to ask the question, is that doing more damage to your economy than a carbon tax would? Very broad-based. Hits all people. They not only raised it a percentage point, they expanded the base, which means it covers more things. Kids' clothing, not opposed to that. But you think about that. Giving that extra source of revenue is helpful. We're raising $1.2 billion a year in it, growing to $1.4 billion in it. We could get into a discussion of how best to use that, in that, that tax revenue. But it is something that provides governments with options. Thank you. David, now you were advising the government of Manitoba on, on climate policy. Mm -hmm. They didn't go along the route of, of carbon pricing. Are there... You did for uh, a little uh, while. <laughs> <laughs> um, you tried. A New York Minute or something. Right. Uh, is there something substantive that they could do using other levers that you think would be effective? Yes, uh, but let me first explain why um, carbon pricing actually has some limits in the Manitoba context and shows how, um, uh, how you know, complicated this, uh, this can be. Um, Manitoba has a clean electricity grid. It's 100% clean. So there's no dirty electricity that, uh, that a carbon price can get at to claw back and reduce emissions. Manitoba has the highest proportion of agriculture emissions in the country. In fact, 2017 data shows that it, Manitoba's ag emissions were 35%. 35% of its total emissions, the, the highest sector and the highest proportion in the country. Ag is not subject to a carbon price. So in both those instances, it shows that Manitoba doesn't have a big economy-wide basis of emissions to really cost-effectively get at with a carbon price on its own, or, or there are limits. So our modeling, and we did a ton of modeling and analysis, showed that, in fact, it probably... You know, it starts to tap out about after about 30 bucks a ton. You get emission reductions or price to a certain point, and then it starts to diminish, and it starts to become eh, a little more uh, expensive. We modeled out the federal measures. Federal, 50 bucks a ton, all the way out to 2030. Manitoba's emissions in 2030 would be 2 megatons less in 2030 with the federal measures than without. It's not a lot. It's something. But... It just shows there are certain limits. So what we are doing is, it, and this was part of the plan even before we had carbon pricing, I say we because I am still, uh, transparency, I'm still helping the government out on this, um, is we're putting in a suite of non-pricing measures. And we're doing that through something that is quite original, quite unique, the only place in the country. We don't actually have a target. There is no emission reduction target in Manitoba. We do not suffer from targetitis. My target is bigger than your target and whatever. We don't <laughs> suffer from that. Nice and flat on the prairies, right? <laughs> we said, look, we've got to bend the curve, and we have to do this in an incremental way. There's no one-off thing that is really going to work, so we are creating five-year carbon savings accounts. So think of a carbon budget which says this is how much you will emit. Carbon savings account says this is how much you will reduce. So it's sort of the flip side, but it's analogous. It's the only place in the country that is having that, that is looking to do that, and I'm advising the, an, an independent independent expert advisory council established in, by statute in legislation to give the government advice on what that target should be. Again, the only place in Canada that's doing that. What will we come up with? We'll come up with things like energy efficiency. We'll come up with things like uh, uh, fuel content, uh, you know, a percentage of, of clean fuel. 
building standards and other things. <clears throat> All non-pricing measures because the government has taken a political position that it will not have its own carbon price, uh, per se, and the federal backstop, as you know, uh, applies. So not having carbon pricing is not stopping us. It'll be a legitimate question to say, okay, could you have res- had more in the way of emission reductions without it? And the fact is, with the backstop, we will have a bit of interaction uh, uh, with it. So it's, uh, uh, it is something to keep in mind on this. You can do things, and you should do things, with your whole toolbox. Carbon pricing is a key part of it, and I'm a proponent of it because I think it does set the parameters, and and as Nancy's talked about. But the idea that we should just use that one tool is not something that I I, I think the folks who do, you know, who are experts in this really, you know, they don't advocate for that, and I certainly don't advocate for that. But that gets lost in the mix. That's true. And as a result of it, we don't have a very nuanced conversation about how to do this. In the meantime, emissions climb and climb and climb. We don't have a nuanced conversation about a lot of things, I find, <laughs> these days. Um, going sure on to a, another tool, so Lynn, you've been a really key voice in Canada pushing for financial disclosure of climate risks, and you, you wrote a really interesting report for IISD recently where, where you say, in Canada, disclosure of climate risk remains insufficient in many cases and non-existent in others. So let me back up, though, and ask you to, to explain first what what is disclosure of climate risk? What does that look like in a concrete way? Yeah, so um, this, this initiative or this policy initiative was born um, a couple of months before the Paris Agreement was uh, agreed in 2015 uh, in a very uh, wonky setting, which is the meeting of the central bank governors and uh, finance deputies in Turkey. And, and at that, po- at that time, a request was made of the Financial Stability Board to create something that we eventually called the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. Um, it's really not particularly a beautiful name, but you might, you might also he- hear about it referred to as the TCFD. Um, and the TCFD was, uh, was structured as a private sector-led initiative um, that uh, brought together uh, long-term investors, so pension funds, including CPPIB, and was one of the one of the investors at the table, um, and and others, including insurance companies, uh, to establish some sort of a, a, a framework which would guide the disclosure of climate-related uh, risk to investors um, by by issuers or, you know, what I guess what can also refer, be referred to very simply as companies um, and, you know, where that information was also in some way guaranteed or assured by, uh, by accountants and, and actuaries and others who have responsibility for making sure that the numbers are actually, you know, say, say what, they, what they actually should say. Um, and so the, the TCFD uh, recommendations were, were put forward, and, and really at a, at a fundamental level, they say two things, uh, actually three. The first is, what is the impact of climate change on your business, you Fortune 500 company or, or any company for that, for that matter? And the second is, what is the impact of your business on climate change? And then if you wanted to just be a little bit you know, more complete, you could, you could add around that, and what liability risks exist in your company that have something to do with climate change? And I sometimes call those the, sort of the two heads of the you know, two sides of the chocolate coin, and then the liability one is like the gold wrapper that goes around it. Right. So it's a really simple idea that um, you know most uh, most company uh, CEOs and most uh, pension funds can can understand. I guess I'd, I'd just add sort of one, there's, you know, since then, since the task force has come up with its recommendations, there's been one other thing added, and that is people have stopped and said, but you guys, you know, pension funds, uh, what's the risk in your portfolio, right? So it's one thing to ask the companies to do that, but well, what about us, the beneficiaries and the savers who have been, you know, putting our money in, in, in pension funds and long-term uh, investments, What's the impact of climate change on you? And so all of a sudden the pension funds are going to go, oh, you want us to, to talk about this too? Mm-hmm. What, um, what would so, a risk be, for example? Uh, so, you know, there have there, been about $320 billion of insured and uninsured losses caused by weather. 
over the, uh, just in 2017. So, you know, those insured and uninsured uh, losses are an example of climate-related risk where, um, you know, cl climate change <coughs> is having an impact on your business. So, for example, if you run uh, a large um, company that, um, that does logistics and, and, you know, supply chain, just think of it as Amazon, for example, um, you know, climate change is going to affect your business because... Uh, there will be days when it's too hot to, for, for the planes to take off, right? Mm. If, you're, if one of your hubs is in the southern U.S., well, you're just going to, there are days where you're just not going to be able to do business because it's too hot. I mean, and, and obviously, you know, your warehouses, if they're located in certain places that are prone to flooding, well, you know, you probably should be mapping where your, your warehouses are and how they compare to floodplains and, and to other extreme weather events. So those are examples of the the impact of climate change on your business. In terms of the impact of your business on climate change, that's where we get to scenarios. Um, and uh, we're going to hear a lot more about scenarios in the, in the coming uh, next uh, few years. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons for that is because even the International Energy Agency is starting to, to see that it needs to be able to produce a scenario that, that uh, it ensures that... You know, Everybody has access to energy, and, and that includes access to energy for cooling because it's a big productivity impact, um, but also that uh, you know, we, we use the carbon budget wisely. And so if you, if you have time to read the, you know, the 1.5 degree IPCC report, you'll see there's an awful lot in there about scenarios, right? And I guess the, the things that you need to know as far as scenarios is that um, you know, to what extent do we have uh, a view that we're going to have a big vacuum cleaner to suck carbon out of the air, uh, you know, after 2040 or, you know, in 2050? And, and your view on the, the degree to which we can suck carbon out of the air uh, will fundamentally inform the scenarios, and that, those scenarios will fundamentally drive the impact of your business on climate change and the value of your assets. So... I took a, a welfare model um, that allocates uh, hydrocarbon budgets around the world according to cost, and I tuned it to various uh, carbon scenarios and to the carbon budgets associated with those scenarios and published probably what's Canada's first um, assets at risk scenario. And it goes from, you know, pretty well aligned, you know, what, what we have in terms of proved and probable reserves that are disclosed in financial statements by Canadian oil, oil and gas companies are sort of aligned with the budget, all, of, all the way to, you know, 13% of GDP at risk. So what happens when you, when you uh, have a system that demands uh, disclosure of climate risk? What happens to capital? The well, movement of capital. Yeah, so so pension funds are now um, increasingly under pressure, and we we you know as a policy instrument, that's something that we as people can can engage with. Um, they're being asked. So, to, to what extent are your um, are your investments aligned with the Paris Agreement? And so, you know, it, it actually affects where pension funds put their money. Um, it affects what kind of infrastructure they're prepared to spend money on. It affects how they, uh, you know, sort of what kind of buildings. Are the buildings going to be energy efficient or not? Are they going to be uh, investing in uh, electricity transmission assets, as an example? Uh, are they going to, um, you know, for example, be shareholders in certain pipelines? Um, you know, all of those things become subject to scrutiny uh, because disclosure is you know, going to require that uh, for example, in France, all the pension funds there are required to have their directors sign that all their investments are consistent with the Paris Agreement. Um, so disclosure is a way of putting, of ensuring that all the boards of directors of all public companies, of all public institutions, actually have to understand climate change and how their investments are consistent with our commitments to the Paris Agreement or not. Can I project yes. something? I think what Celine's talking about is really important, and it's one of the examples of where the, the, the two prongs of climate change, one is how do you reduce GHG emissions, and the other is how do we prepare and increase our resilience, so the adaptation theme. 
And, and that kind of uh, disclosure, that sort of policy instrument, is saying we have to pay attention to both. And companies that do will start to thrive and do thrive, and companies that don't will see not only shareholders finally abandoning them, but their assets being you know, de devalued and, and in some cases destroyed. So it's a really good example. I like to think of quadrants where we're, we're not just trying to reduce them. We're, we're going to have to adapt as well, and that's a great example of a kind of policy that looks at both in a, in a, in a combined way. So uh, there's there's different uh, there's been different responses. Uh, let me go back to carbon pricing, to to uh, why carbon pricing is not the right tool or or that doesn't go far enough. So there's the the Mark uh, Jacker point of view, which is that um, it's it's never going to work because it'll never never be politically palatable. But there's another point of view, which is that carbon pricing is just you're never going to get where you want to get because oh, the, the price that's being proposed is much too low. I'm thinking Jason McLean from the University of Saskatchewan has written about this saying, like, the public is just going to, you're going to lose the public. It's too gradual. We're never going to get to our targets. And so you have people talking about um, restraining supply, uh, oil supply from the oil sands, um, about uh, zero carbon uh, more, much more quickly. Uh, what, do, what do you say to that, that it's just carbon pricing is just not enough and that we need to move faster? Well, I think David gave a really good example of trying to figure out how best to do it. And as David said, and I agree, there are going to be multiple prongs that we have to take. I'm not a fan of quotas. Show me a quota where they've got it right. You know, how do you pick it? Um, I don't want to see them. I mean, well, there is a quota in Saskatchewan on aggregate tar sands, uh, tar, uh, oil sands uh, and, uh, extraction, but is that the right number? I don't know. Governments are real good at picking things that are physical quantities and fish plants and things Okay, so like maybe that. not a quota, but why build a pipeline then if, it, well, if it's just going to increase your emissions? Because Celine's going to take care of that. <laughs> the investors are going to take care of that. You know, the market works here. What we're trying to do is make it work better by including, whether it's an implicit or an explicit price, part of what Mark Jacquard is saying is people like to be fooled. Do you? You really don't want to know what you're paying for things? That's Mark's argument, because every policy has an implicit price. And if that implicit price is higher than an alternative policy, do you really want it? But, you know, if you like to be fooled and you're happier paying $2 for a banana than a dollar for a banana, bad example, we don't produce them, uh, you know, you'd rather pay less for something than that, you'd rather pay more for the exact same thing, okay, that's fine. But to me, that doesn't get at the picture. Mm -hmm. But I want to come back to what, what David said is, if you want to control fugitive emissions from methane, it's not a price on carbon, it's regulation. So, I mean, I'm with Mark on, you know, there are things, clean fuel standards, as long as they're more flexible. Uh, clean BC, our, our plan that was announced by the, uh, by the government in December. I mean, we got every sector of the economy. We have the wedges, David. We got, you know, sure. falling off the cliff things. And we've got policies for every sector. Do I like all of them? Do I like giving subsidies to high-income people to buy an electric vehicle? Not so much. But... We've got them in all the dimensions. So I think this is a false dichotomy. And I think if we get on the kind of things we're talking about here, which is truthful, fulsome, reveal your numbers kind of discussions, we can maybe get beyond that we can't go there sort of thing. No, I mean, we're not going to go to a $300 a ton carbon price tomorrow. But the implicit price of some of the regulations coming in, hold your hats, folks, those are, those are pretty high. You know, we're talking $100, $150, $200 a ton. The Scrap It program, I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone. The Scrap It program, take in your old car, give it, we give you cash for it. $4,000 a ton to remove carbon. You want to pay that price? It's okay. I'd rather put the money into health care and education. So, well, I'll be the devil's advocate here, which is that that the, the, maybe the average Canadian voter just doesn't have time to read all this uh, material, some of which is fairly complex, on, on carbon pricing, on climate policy. And so maybe, uh, I'll ask all of you, maybe 
we need to talk differently about sure. about climate policy? I mean, is there is there a way that we can make it more politically palatable uh, to people who are very busy and who just might be more receptive to easy messages? Um, yeah. And impl- yes, but you have to work <laughs> hard to get to yes to, to use the over to overuse the, ex- the overused expression. Look, an implicit carbon price has never lost anyone in an election. Right. Right. Once some. Well, I'm so, sorry. Excuse me. Hang yes. On. Yes. It has. It, uh, I, no, you're wrong. You're going to say BC? Yeah, I'm going to say BC. You're going to say when Carol James was leader uh, of the NDP? Our, our current minister of finance yeah. as, uh, as saw the light of day. So it did lose an election. I stand corrected. You don't count Stefan Dion in there. No, I, uh, I don't. Uh, there are some that I don't because um, uh, I mean, his was going to be you know, seen as this tax on everything, everything. and it was also Stefan Dion. To be, I mean, elections, no, but oh, uh, elections so turn on other things, right, and, uh, and the rest of it. But, but, but the point is... With all due respect. The point is um, politicians... <laughs> For the most part, do not think that uh, they are go- they are going to be at risk on, when it comes to carbon pricing. That they're going to be at risk by having implicit carbon prices or not a you know a stated carbon price versus versus a, 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 an explicit price. That is still seen as a more prudent political move. And until that changes, and, and, and my feeling is, and this has been that that governments that bring in a carbon price have to win at least one election on it. And that's, in fact, what did happen with, uh, with BC. And then the political and societal consensus settled in and, uh, and, uh, and, and away we go. Deal. And that's why this election will be you know, so, uh, so important. I mean, we should, at, at one level, not be too chagrined that we have different views out there uh, on this in terms of the right way to go after carbon emissions and climate action and that. I am with Nancy that I don't have much time at all for somebody who uses that as a way to obfuscate doing anything on it. You know, now it's too expensive, so therefore we got to let's think it over for another ten years, years or twenty yeah. years. Which is we've already like been waiting for. But yeah. but we are uh, we are risking the the our you know the our society the way we we talk to each other as Canadians. If we do not take on board and understand that there are some very strong views against act, or not against acting, I guess, in the sense of, of, of climate change, the deniers, the skeptics, but against uh, an overt carbon price and what the implications uh, are, we have uh, uh, you know families and communities that are totally reliant on the uh, on the energy sector that worry about uh, you know, what's going to happen to them. And so we have to find ways to engage uh, uh, those uh, very interested publics, if you will, and, and those who have a lot at stake in a way to bring them along. And the, uh, the idea of a, of a moralistic, you know, this is you know, imposed on you, I mean, you're, it's not surprising. People push back. They don't like it uh, there. So we have to find a way to respect what people have done, what they've contributed, and help them through, ideally, this ama- uh, incredible disruption that's going to happen, which you know, we're calling transition, for example. <clears throat> transition doesn't, you know, as a word, uh, doesn't work for many folks in Alberta because they see it as a transition away. I mean, they want security. So the, some of the words we use, some of the words environmentalists use and, and that are just, they're off-putting. Telling people, thou shalt do this, and this is going to happen to you if you don't do it. I mean, it's, well, wait a minute, it's all on me or something. You know, no wonder you push back uh, at it. So uh, we have not yet found a way as Canadians, let alone our political parties, uh, to do this. And we will be more polarized at, at the end of this election, regardless of it. But we, as Canadians, have a good way of turning the page. You know, the end of, we can and will turn the page on it and, uh, and act. But we're, it's, it's just going to be uh, a bit messy and certainly not uh, linear. So, Lynn, how do you think that you get the public to feel a sense of ownership in climate policy? Because I, I think you and I agree, we've talked about this before, that there's not much to make the average person feel like they're doing something. Like, a lot of it seems like it's other actors, big companies, um, policymakers that are doing the work, but that they themselves don't have any role. Yeah, no, I, I guess I'm, I'm all for the idea of uh, 
you know, the, the rock star approach to climate policy. And, and I, I, I had the, uh, well, I was just thrilled yesterday to see that on the Oscars, uh, you know, we, that uh, Bohemian Rhapsody was given such a, a, a great, uh, great deal of recognition. And one of the, one of the neatest parts of that movie is when they, they talk about making the songs belong to the fans, right? So how do we make climate policy belong to Canadians? And, and I think it really be, it, 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 it's, it's on us to think about that. And, and you know, I, I, I think, for example, of um, you know, what was done after the Second World War uh, to um, you know, make reconciliation or, or the, yeah, the, the, the memorial, like, memorialization of the Second World War uh, real to people in their communities. And, you know, every community built a cenotaph, and and it, it was you know it was our participation, our contribution to, to the values that that you know we were defending in the Second World War, and I and I really wonder the degree to which we can do something like that, as far as climate policy, and and it, you know it, it, I think of uh, for example land use, um, I think of the way, uh, you know a, a, a small city or a town could make a contribution to. Canada's climate plan by um, by you know managing a wetland in a certain way, by having uh, certain agricultural practices be the sort of norm for that city or town. Um, I think of uh, you know energy efficiency and and how our homes are you know the way that we th- the way we we th- interact with energy on a daily basis. These are all very practical things where where we as people and and our neighbors uh, where we can make a difference. Um, and so, yeah, I just think that uh, that our approach to, to climate policy does does need to start getting much more grounded in the way you know we as people are uh, are engaging with the question. And for some people, that may be their pension, right? And the way you know the way their their pension fund, you know, whether we're public servants who have uh, our pension with the, the PSP, or we're teachers, or 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 even you know those of us who, who contribute just to CPPIB through. Um, CPP uh, contributions. So I think we need to bring it bring it down to the individual and, and what you know we can do in in not just in big cities but in in small towns and in communities across across Canada and the way we are stewards of energy. Can, can yes. I? Yeah. The um, we've done a lot of polling in in my province and asked people what they care about. And one reason our policy is called Clean BC <laughs> is they want to protect their environment. Nobody wants to deliberately go out and pollute a stream or, you know, generate things that make people sick. (coughs) Most people don't. And, you know, (laughs) there are a few. Uh, But, you know, it's it's painting that picture of what do you want to see. And I think back to some strategies that have worked really well. Uh, I was on the board of BC Hydro for a while, a long time, and they had, I, I thought this was goofy, but I was completely wrong. They had a competition among municipalities to see who could be the most energy efficient. I mean, municipalities like they were in it, I'm going to beat Burnaby and I'm going to beat Salmon Arm. And it was hugely, it was a community gathering and and it it brought people together. I mean, energy efficiency, who's opposed to energy efficiency? I mean, you know, if I can get the lights on at a lower cost and burn less of them, I just want to be comfortable. So like Celine said, and, and David said, we want, to have, we want to have warm houses, we want to have jobs. So there are things that communities can get, can get engaged in. The other thing is, and I just want to comment on, on the one thing David said, and that is all policies, big policy changes require transition. And it requires going after the most vulnerable, the ones that are going to be the most affected by it. And David mentioned the, the free trade issue. Free trade made Canada better off. But there were some groups that were harmed. There's no question. Mm -hmm. And a good country, good policy addresses those people that are harmed. So, for example, in our policy platform, we have jobs training and retraining, preparing people for future jobs that are going to be there, not jobs that are going to disappear. So that's part and parcel of it. It's not... This, this simple, just put a, put a price on it and we go home. That's not what anybody's talking about. It's talking about the whole package where you've got the, the, the provisions in place. And that's the kind of discussion we've got to have more of. We have to be realistic about where the problem lies. The emissions problem for Canada lies principally in two provinces, Alberta and Saskatchewan, in terms of oil and gas emissions pushing us way past any ability to achieve our targets. 
um, oil and gas or energy resource, exploitation of energy resources constitutionally uh, belongs to the provinces. So we have to rely a lot on provincial policy direction and, and, uh, and assertion to actually uh, do this. So what works, this is very Canadian, but we maybe just need to remind ourselves of it. What works in one jurisdiction, one part of the country, doesn't necessarily work in the, in the other part. So we have a political economy problem, which is exacerbated by a political party problem, which is one party gets most of its seats, its base is in those provinces in Western Canada. And this is just, and, and, and other parties don't. <laughs> Put it on the flip side. It just is. Just is. But you can't just ignore that and dismiss that. Because we have only, at this stage, two political parties that are capable of forming government in Canada. So, kind of, you're going to have one or the other. My objective, in many ways, is to have both parties acting on climate. Yeah. If I can have both parties doing the, the most cost-effective way, I mean, I, you know, hallelujah. But I want both of them to act on climate. I want both of them to take it seriously. Because I know that's the longer-term view of, of where we got to go. And what I was hoping to do in Manitoba with a Conservative government was show that, in fact, a Conservative government got this and could do this and do it in a Manitoba way, a made-in-Manitoba solution. We were the first to come up with made-in. Everybody now has a made in Ontario, made in Alberta, made in New Brunswick. So we were the first to do that. Plus, we, we actually commissioned a legal opinion that is now, oh my, gone to the Saskatchewan Supreme Court. So we caused all this problem. Just tiny little Manitoba. Just you, it, David. Well, actually, just me. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to forge a way forward in the midst of that and not having some, you know, full success, but having you know, some success. So we have to confront these, these realities uh, of, of where we're at. And that's why I think we can and should have, will have, a climate election, a clarifying election. And I think this is the way, actually, to move it forward. Because I don't see any one policy tool. I don't see a consensus emerging amongst... Uh, you know the, all the political actors on how to uh, on how to do this that'll find favor with most uh, with sufficient Canadians. So we need to vote on this, and we need to then send you know send a signal. The problem is the marketplace, not the carbon pricing marketplace, climate marketplace. That's there, disclosure, carbon pricing. It's the political marketplace. Where are the votes, and how can I get enough of those votes to act in a certain way, and Again, I go back to I, I want, we should all want our political parties to be doing something on to take this seriously and find a way forward. And we will get going on this. And if we can put carbon pricing in place, I, it'll just start. And once we find, in fact, like in BC, it's actually livable, some other things will happen. The signals will start with the market. It'll ex accelerate the kinds of things I think Celine has been talking about. It'll push us in that certain direction. So I'm not looking for perfection. I've been in politics, so it's not ever going to happen. But we've got to have enough action that we can turn the page as a country. So vote. Great conversation. I'm sure you'll agree. Um, so please join me in thanking our panel, Nancy, David, and Celine. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank uh, McGill University's Max Bell School of Public Policy for being our partner on this series of events. Uh, so you'll see up there our third event is on April 2nd on uh, Indigenous Crown Relations. We pick all the easy topics, yep. you see, at this, <laughs> at this series. And we have another great event in, uh, in May on uh, electoral integrity and disinformation. There's a, there's a link between all of these topics. Uh, the first one was on, on our tax system. So they, they, there's a correlation between all of them. It's interesting. Uh, I'd like to thank my colleagues, um, Suzanne Lambert and Shirley Cardenas, um, who have been uh, helping out and, and making this run so smoothly. And uh, I hope you join us again for our next two events or maybe just one more event. Uh, thank you for coming out today on this early morning. I appreciate it. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Thanks,